You've probably heard about the Salem Witch Trials, how people accused each other of murderous deeds in the middle of the night, how they turned on each other and then told fantastic stories of suffering for the jury in court. But what came next? How did people punish witches convicted of their craft? Find out today on Footnoting History. Welcome to Footnoting History. I am your host, Leslie Skousen, and today I'm going to talk about how the English Parliament decided to punish those found guilty of mystical offenses. During the 15th to 18th centuries, much of Europe saw a sharp rise in the accusations and prosecutions of witchcraft. Some of this had to do with the social and economic changes that also contributed to the Renaissance, the demographic upheaval associated with the Black Death, the necessary developments in scientific and medical discovery, and the ability to spread new ideas by using the printing press. This in turn helped to spread the ideas of the Reformation, and what might in previous years have been a simple debate between Luther and his superiors became a continent-wide rebellion that caused the Protestant Reformation. The groundswell of new faith and the ideas created space for all members of society to think differently of the nature of miracles and their opposite mysterious occurrences, and what might be attributed to the devil rather than to saints or God, witchcraft. At the same time, shifts in public services created a new underclass of poverty that had no convent or Catholic social services to help them. These poor souls would often be the victims of witchcraft trials, people who were new in town, people who had few allies, those who suffered from mental health issues, the homeless, the disabled, widows, spinsters, unattached singles. This historical context is important, and there are many books about these contributing factors for the great winch hunts of the early modern period. Once hunted, once captured, once convicted, how were these sorcerers punished? Many of us have an image in our minds of being burned at the stake, yet death by burning is a very painful, public, drawn-out death. The screaming lasts longer than one might think. Those observing may feel pity for the dying. In Salem, our most famous American witchcraft event, all 20 convicted witches were executed by hanging. Let's examine the laws in England, which would form the basis of American colonial witchcraft trials, to consider how to punish a witch. In 1542, the Parliament of Henry VIII saw fit to pass a new law, one that would formalize criminality of witchcraft and sorcery. Entitled The Bill Against Conjurations and Witchcrafts and Sorcery and Enchantments, this bill declared acts of witchcraft to be felony without benefit of clergy. The given reason for this law is that it reflected activities already common, but not actually illegal. Where diverse and sundry persons unlawfully have devised invocations and conjurations of spirits in order to ensnare the spirits of their neighbors, to find money or treasure, to attack or destroy any person's body, goods, passions, or even to incite love for unlawful purpose. This law set about to discourage such magical crimes and to deliver those people to the courts for punishment. The law named and defined what specific behaviors were deemed to be witchcraft or sorcery. Such acts would be felonies punishable by death by hanging with no benefit of clergy. In addition to hanging such offenders after conviction of a jury by their peers, convicts of this law would have a secondary punishment to their goods and property. The crown would inherit all belongings. The heir and widow, if any, would be cut off from any goods that might have been tainted by magic and even those proven to be obtained legally. The act of witchcraft sacrificed all property to the crown for this offense. Henry VIII criminalized magic officially by statute. The law would stand for only a few years. At the succession of his son, Edward VI, Parliament passed a new law repealing all former statutes from the reign of the dead king. In theory, this practice allowed for the new boy king and his more radical Protestant ministers to create a new idealized flurry of laws empowering their religious agenda. They never saw fit to identify witchcraft as a major threat, so no new law replaced it, and witchcraft spent over a decade without any existing law written against it. In 1563, under his sister Queen Elizabeth, Parliament enacted a new law re-recognizing witchcraft. Elizabeth's law had much in common with the initial legislation under Henry VIII. The bill, an act against conjurations, enchantments, and witchcrafts, penalized those who used spells for murder, or devastating assault first and foremost. Those were the real criminals in a culture that believed black magic could cause such things. 
Offenders would be felons without benefit of clergy just as before and executed by hanging. However, lesser offenses were provided with a multi-tier system. This is where punishing witches gets really interesting. So, for instance, if someone used a spell in order to make someone lame or damage without destroying a building, to injure a piece of land by making it incapable of growing any farming, or harm but not kill a domesticated animal. All of these kinds of lesser offenses were tied to a lesser punishment. For the first offense, the convict would spend a year in prison, during which every three months he or she would be required to attend a local market day or festival and publicly confess their crimes and lament over their actions over a period of six hours. Imagine standing in front of a crowd of people at a festival and confessing your sins for six hours straight. And that's not all. A second offense would mean execution by hanging. One more level of punishment existed. The third tier of offenders were those who read palms, sold fortune-seeking advice, or engaged in making love potions. These sorcerers would be given the year-long treatment in jail with the market day confessions, and only after multiple offenses, repeated imprisonments, would they finally be declared felons and executed by hanging. In an interesting twist, Elizabeth's law would actually be kinder to the next of kin in criminals convicted of magic. They would still be felons and they would still lose their lives, but their property had a different destiny saving to the wife the, or the person her title of dower and also to the heir and successor such person his or their titles inheritance succession and all rights as though no such attainder of the ancestor or predecessor had been made it says very officially in other words while henry the eighth ensured that the crown took possessions of the property and goods of a magician after execution elizabeth's parliament felt the next of kin should go ahead and inherit those goods and not be punished for the sins of the relative. The only condition under which the crown would still take goods and property of an offender of witchcraft was after the multiple convictions in that third tier category, someone who had been convicted repeatedly of defrauding the public with fortune telling, palm reading, selling maps to fortune hunters, or selling love potions. In an age where trust and honesty were critical to social interaction, allowing this pretense threatened the idea of a person's honor as paramount in mercantile or legal dealings, even in unions of marriage. Combating repeated fraud required the threat of a firm punishment. Execution and the forfeit of all goods might provide that threat without executing a fortune hunter or palm reader on their first offense. England was not the only kingdom worried about the use of magic by criminal minds. Scotland also enacted new penalties for acts perceived as harmful magic. The timing reflected a key discussion of faith, God, and the Catholic ideal of miracles. After all, if saints could master the white magic of curing illnesses and misfortune by appealing to God's ever-loving forgiveness, if angels or Mary could cure the sick and wounded, surely a devilish power could do the opposite. After all, animals died mysteriously, barns collapsed, people disappeared. What could not be explained may be the result of a secret threat. And so, in 1563, the same year as Elizabeth's witchcraft law, Scotland passed its own bill to criminalize witchcraft and sorcery. In this law, the act of witchcraft plus the consultation of a witch were criminalized. The idea of seeking unearned fortunes, unrequited love, or secrets to success were lesser offenses but nevertheless criminalized. As in Elizabeth's bill, the most important offense was the murder or assault on a human body. The law itself was somewhat vague, however, failing to address the issues of trial, definition, evidence, and the actions that would lead to death. As a result, this law left a lot to the judgment of local people overseeing trials. Some estimates suggest that as many as 2,000 people were convicted and executed under this Scottish law as it was written, many of them experiencing drastically different punishments depending on their location and communities. This Scottish aspect would be important since James VI of Scotland became James I of England. Witchcraft numbered among his priorities as he stepped into the English monarchy. One of his first acts in England was to re-criminalize witchcraft and sorcery. In 1604, his law repealed and replaced the anti-magic law from Elizabeth. Her punishments in the multi-tiered program of penalties suggests that James, his ministers, or his parliament in general, believed her law from 50 years earlier to be too kind and too lenient. 
This new law had a new magical crime to add to the others. It found the use of dead body parts for the purpose of witchcraft to be a felonious offense, regardless of the spell or intent used. Love potion, sick animal, bush go up in flames, stop a beating heart. So long as the spell required the part of a corpse, the consequence was felony hanging with no opportunity to plead benefit of clergy and seek sanctuary or asylum. Collaborators would also suffer death as punishment, no exceptions. The lesser offenses outlined under Elizabeth were also replaced under James. Crimes such as brewing and applying love potions or using charms in order to find hidden treasure still required a year in prison for the first offense, coming out every quarter as before to a public place like a market or a festival in order to declare your crimes and guilt. But if they were found guilty just that second time, the penalty was death by hanging. These laws show us what fears informed legislative writers, not what crimes threatened small towns across England and Scotland. That difference between law and trial must be kept in mind. Historians have written important analyses about the effect of witchcraft on women and the members of society down on their luck, the homeless, the injured, the weak, the helpless, or even just the unpopular and powerless. What fascinates me is what was so threatening to these members of parliament writing the bills over time. So under Henry VIII, Parliament describes magic as taking specific forms, the mysterious death of a person, the assault or laming of a person, the effect of poisoning their mind, which we might identify as epilepsy or deteriorating mental health. Also included was the death or maiming of an animal, the harm or destruction of property, the magical knowledge of hidden treasures or resources, and, of course, love potions. It occurs to me that all of this can be traced back to property ownership, this is the possession of our lives and our bodies, first and foremost, but then followed by uh, treasure hunting and property loss, and then finally, using sinister means to fall in love, which by marriage could again lead to consequences for property. Perhaps this makes most sense when we consider that any offender convicted of these actions, large or small, would be executed and his or her property forfeited to the crown under this initial law under Henry VIII. The law under Elizabeth was similar to that of Henry VIII, but her parliament tiered the punishments for behaviors according to their perceived threats. The repeated offenders who took money for love potions and treasure finding were still at risk for execution and forfeiting that property, but they had to become repeat offenders to be executed. James was less sympathetic for those repeat offenders. His parliament wrote a law that included more fatal penalties for more types of magical crimes and only allowed a single offense for Elizabeth's third tier of crimes before they were sent up for execution. What happens at the legislative level must be compared to the trial level, and this is where laws are interpreted, applied, and thrust upon actual lives. But however single justices decided to interpret these laws as they were enacted, repealed, and replaced, the language of the law endured. As England settled colonies in the Americas, new witchcraft laws and witch hunts affected local communities, isolated from the English-speaking world. The most famous of these were the Salem Witch Trials of the 1690s. Following this historically significant event, the British Parliament produced a new sweeping revision in a landmark law in 1735. The Witchcraft Law of 1735 changed direction from previous treatments of magical crimes. Instead of punishing by death or public humiliation, it simplified everything by making it a crime to use or pretend to use any spell at all, and to brag that one had magical abilities or to do any type of sorcery. For all of these offenses in a single offense, the maximum penalty was a single year imprisonment. Punishments were beginning to change. The Bridewell and debtor's prisons had become the prison we know today, and it was a more established method of punishment over execution. A year or two in prison with harsh clothes, regimented schedule, a strict Christian study, and exercise might provide offenders of anything with a new lease on life. They increased it in use in the 18th century forward. Furthermore, the law of 1735 marked the end of the great witch hunt and the beginning of a legally recognized form of superstition, only really threatening to a community in terms of causing friction rather than literally sending death through evil thoughts or ensnaring a stranger in love by adding a potion to their drink. The law's passage did invoke a little pushback, most famously from the sincerely held beliefs of Lord Erskine, who organized protests against its passage for fear of magical crime running rampant across the English countryside. Aside from him and his followers, however, 
most members of Parliament saw witchcraft laws as an outdated fear from the Reformation. And not much changed after the penalties were greatly reduced. Women continued to be suspected of witchcraft, but it was due to interpreting superstitions, and that varied across different counties. The reasons for jailing were, were less about fear of the devil's magic and more about catching frauds and punishing them accordingly. So how does one punish a witch? To start, you put her through hell. You accuse her of witchcraft. You isolate her from any friends or family. You make her sit through trial. That trial might force her to disrobe in public to examine any possible devil's mark. A, a birthmark, a scar, a superfluous third nipple could be the secret sign of where the devil touched her and gave her the power of magic. Then, if convicted, a witch may be hanged. If convicted of a lesser version of witchcraft, she may be imprisoned for a year, dragged out every so often, and forced to stand with a paper on her head shouting about her crimes for all to hear for six hours. She may be released, a shell of her former self, embarrassed and lonely. But she wouldn't be burned, not in England, at least, nor Scotland, nor Salem. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>